see is probably a better bet and use the invert push it out as needed again on standard ignition where you go to the coil wire invert pull it out on HEI you pull it out and on DIS you pull it out as needed we're ready to start the car Hi, I'm George Menchu of Automotive Electronic Services. In this video, we will examine the application and use of the analog dual trace oscilloscope for use on automotive ignitions. The focus is going to be on the secondary waveform. By the end of this video, you will see how well suited the analog scope is for this purpose. During the course of this video, I will guide you through the process of setting up and connecting your lab scope to an ignition system. And we will also examine the thought process, or should I say the strategy, of using a scope. And before we go to the shop, let's talk about that strategy. It's a fairly simple one, and it can save you time. Using the lab scope, we can view ignition in two ways, superimpose and parade. Superimpose will draw each plug signal one on top of the other. Or we can parade, which will display one cylinder signal next to the other across the screen. If there is a bad plug, Superimpose will not let us determine which one. Yet, this is the quickest way to make connections to the system. The basis for this strategy, start with superimpose and parade if necessary. When looking at the secondary waveform, we can generalize the problem into three categories, and this is very easy when you superimpose. All plug signals are good, two. Some plug signals are bad, three. All are bad. Now, in the case of all good, there is no reason to take the time to parade. And remember, just because a secondary looks good doesn't mean that the spark is getting to the plug or getting there at the right time. So don't forget your basic understanding of the system and cover the basis. Now, if they are all bad, you still don't need to parade. In this case, of course, you would check the things that can affect all of them. The driver, the signal, distribution, the power and grounds, and the primary circuit. If some are bad, then you might want to take the time to parade and find out which ones. To summarize, start with superimpose. This is the quickest way to determine the ignition condition and what your next action should be. And if you are faced with a some bad situation, parade to identify which ones are bad. Before we go to the shop, let's take a quick look at the scope and the test leads that we're going to be using. This scope is a Hitachi V212 dual trace 20 megahertz analog scope. 20 megahertz refers to how fast the scope can react to a signal. And this is more than fast enough for automotive. When purchasing an analog scope, there is no reason to get anything slower than 20 megahertz. And this is because of the pricing of scopes. Now, dual trace or the dual channel means that this will allow you to look at two waveforms on the display at a time. Let's take a close look at the control panel. The Hitachi controls are laid out according to function. Up here in the top left, we have the horizontal controls. It will control the horizontal position and how fast the waveform is drawn on the screen. Next, we have the trigger controls. They're the toughest ones to uh, master, but well worth the time, and it's just a matter of doing it. These control when the waveform is displayed on the screen. Down here, we have the channel one input and this is considered a vertical section because it can control the vertical position and the size of the waveform which also sets the volts per division setting for the grid on the display. We can also change the input calibration. We can have AC, DC, or ground. Channel two is basically the same. There is one difference, and channel two gives us the option to invert the waveform. Now, this is what we're going to use for secondary ignition. Here in the center, we have the display mode. The display mode sets whether channel one is being displayed, channel two, or both. Now, let's quickly go back and set up the scope. First thing that we're going to want to do is set the intensity to full and focus the scope. When the waveform is nice and sharp, we're all set there. The time per division, we might want to come back and set to about 5 milliseconds per division, which is a good general area to work with in automotive. 
the position knob, make sure the position is centered. This red knob here, this is a sweep calibration for the horizontal time. It has to be in its detent position. This will mean it's got to be in its full right position and you will feel it click into position. If it's not in its detent position, the settings of the time per division will be meaningless to any time measurements on the display. The trigger, we're going to set the mode to auto. This will cause the scope to display regardless of any of the trigger setting. The level does not matter. The source will be set to internal. Now this gets a little confusing here. So watch this. When we're set to internal, we have to come down here to the internal source and set whether we want channel 1, channel 2, or both. We want both and we will set it to the vertical position, which is the bottom position with the uh, toggle switch. Now on the channel 1, let's set up the volts per division to the maximum, all the way to the left, which is the 5 volts per division. Position the waveform in the upper half of the screen, input coupling to DC. Channel 2, again, let's take the black knob and go to the 5 volts per division setting. Use the position to lower it into the bottom half of the screen with the input coupling down to ground, or to DC. The red knobs, again, have to be in the detent position, otherwise you cannot make any volts per division uh, measurements. Now we're all set. One other thing, the mode needs to be set to chop. Notice how it steadied the display a little bit. Chop will cause the waveform to be drawn, each waveform to be drawn together across the screen, as opposed to alternate, which will do the first one and then the second. We've done the pre-setup on the scope. Now that that's done, it's time to get into the test leads. We'll do that in detail at the shop, but for quick identification, we're going to use the chassis ground, which I identified by the large alligator clip, the secondary pickup, which has got the peculiar chrome clip, and the trigger pickup, which looks like an RPM pickup off a timing light. That's all we need. We're only going to use the chassis ground and the secondary pickup for superimposed. We use the trigger pickup only when we want to parade. Now that we've got these identified, let's go to the shop and get to work. We've made it. We're at Dick's Automotive in Clovis, California. Looks like we got a 1987 Toyota Camry waiting for us here. I'm going to use the AES fender mount to hold our scope securely to the fender of the car. It's pretty safe that way. Uh, this 1987 Toyota Camry has an HEI ignition system. It's a four-cylinder. Now the HEI means that we're going to have to connect our secondary pickup to the uh, cap because there is no coil wire. So let's do that real quick. First thing we want to do is hook up our chassis ground. Remember that's the one that's going to give us a solid connection from our scope at our banana plug input on the chassis and we're going to go to the battery negative. In this case, the battery negative is right out here in front, and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't use that. Next, we'll put the secondary pickup, and we're going to install it into channel two. Always install the test leads to the scope before they're connected to the system, because if you don't, these metal test leads and inputs on the scope can short the uh, signal wire out and you don't want that to happen, so put the test lead in the scope first. Since this is an HEI system, we're going to have to make a connection to the uh, distributor cap. On a standard ignition, you want to go to the coil wire. HEI, go to the cap. On DIS, then you go to individual plug wires. And we're going to use this little adapter here that makes it easier to connect to the cap. Let's see if I can show you how to hook that up. Oh boy, look at that pop that cap right out of there. The HEI adapter is going to fit right below this Toyota cap and when you install it, it you got to be very careful to not let the HEI adapter, the metal part of it, touch anything metal on the car because that could ground out our signal. Once it's installed, take the secondary pickup and clip it right onto the adapter and that's all we have to do. Now on some caps, there's a little knob sticking out of the center of the cap. If that's the case, you could slide your secondary pickup right on that knob. The overall goal is to 
connect the secondary pickup to a centralized area on the cap. Remember, do not go to individual plug wires. The signal will be too weak. Now that we've got the test leads connected, it's absolutely important that you make sure that they are routed safely. They're not up against anything hot like the exhaust and they're not next to any moving parts. Because if they are, they're gonna pull right out of the scope, get tangled up and possibly ruin the scope, not to even mention what it could do to the car. Okay, we're ready for our first round of adjustments for secondary superimposed ignition. The first thing that we want to do is set up our time base. Originally, we had set the scope to five milliseconds. Now we're going to go to one millisecond per division, and that's denoted on the scope display as one MS. We're going to do that because, think about it, the ignition spark usually lasts from one to two milliseconds on a good ignition system. Usually it's about one and a half milliseconds. So that'll give us a spark line that will last one division on the scope display. With that set to one millisecond, then we can go over to our trigger. Earlier we set it to auto. It's still set on auto and that's exactly where we want to start. Auto will cause the scope to trigger and give us a display regardless of where the other trigger uh, controls are set and whether we even have a signal or not. We're using channel two and we want to set the channel two volts per division to 50 millivolts. And we're using the AES secondary pickup and that's where it wants to be set. Now the spark, with it set to 50 millivolts using the AES secondary pickup, will rise about one division. And a good spark is going to be about uh, two to 5,000 volts right in that area, depending on the ignition system you're looking at. So you could say that the calibration for this pickup is about 3,000 volts per division when your volts per division is set to 50 millivolts. The input coupling is set to DC and we're going to grab our vertical position knob and pull it out. This will invert the waveform. When we're dealing with standard ignition or HEI systems, we have to invert the waveform or else it'll be upside down. Now on DIS, what happens? You hook up to one plug wire and it's right side up. You hook up to the next and it's going to be upside down. And in that case, you'd want to play with your invert and do it as necessary. All right, let's start up the car and see what we get. The first thing that we're going to do is invert the waveform. Remember, that's over here in the channel 2 vertical section. It's on the position knob. We're going to simply pull it out. When I pull this knob out, watch how the waveform turns upside down. And for our purposes now, it's right side up. I'll do it again. All right, now that we've done that, our second problem was the trigger. We have to set our trigger level. That's up here in the top right, the black knob. Start adjusting your trigger level, either right or left, until the display stabilizes. There we go. Now we're looking at the spark line and the coil oscillations after the spark takes place. Notice how stable it is. Right now, all of the cylinder's plug firings are being overlapped on each other, and we can easily see all of them. Now we have got to make that determination. Are they all good, all bad? or some good. Let's take a close look. The first thing we'll do is invert the waveform. Here in the channel two position knob, we'll pull it out. Watch the waveform. Let's do it again. Here it's upside down. We pull out to invert the waveform on channel two and it turns right side up. You can see the burn line walking across the screen and now it's positioned up. The next thing we need to do is set the trigger level. Our mode is still set to auto, our source is internal. We're going to run the trigger level until the waveform starts to overlap itself. Now you see how clearly it is now? The waveform is each cylinder firing one on top of the other now. And that's because of the triggering. And if you're not careful with your trigger, if you're too low on the trigger, it's going to start walking on you. To help to ensure that we get a good trigger, let's do one more thing. On the trigger mode, put it down one notch to normal. Now normal, if you recall, means that there will not be a display unless the trigger requirements are set. And to prove this, I'm going to take the trigger level and max it out. And what happened? The display disappeared. 
Now I'm going to slowly bring it back in until I get a steady display. Now we are looking at all the ignition firing superimposed. In this case, one through four. And if we look at it very closely, we can see that they're all pretty, pretty much the same. I see one that might be jumping up a little bit. Let's take a close look at that. What we're seeing here, the most, the brightest event right here is the burn time. That's the spark going across the spark plug and the coil oscillation. And then of course after the coil oscillations, there's no activity in the circuit. We're missing the KV line. A lot of us are really familiar with dealing with the KV line for ignition analysis. When a lab scope, that doesn't always work because of the brightness of the shop and the brightness of the display sometimes don't go together and you don't see it. You could see it if you shade it, but you can make your analysis from the spark line. Understanding ignition, you know that the KV line is directly proportional to the burn line. So the more KV to jump across the spark plug, the shorter the burn, that's the distance from the spark line to the coil oscillations, and the higher in voltage it will be. So this line right here that's coming across showing us the spark will raise up higher and shorter. Well, as a matter of fact, if you look closely, you can see one that's doing that. So that's telling us that maybe at least one of the spark plugs has extra resistance in the circuit. Whether the gap's too wide or the spark plug's bad, we don't know at this time. So again, KV line is proportional to the burn line. On the lab scope, we're going to use the burn line to make our analysis. We have the coil oscillations, and of course, that's the energy left over that couldn't jump across the spark plug. I'm going to slow down the sweep speed a little bit. Now we can see another event taking place, and we can see the dwell time begin. Right here, the driver completes the negative side of the coil to ground. Current starts to flow. When the current flows, we see a ramp come up. And once the ramp comes up, we have a little step. Now, what would cause that little step? Current control. The step is there for current control. We used to have ballast resistors and resistor wires going to the positive side of the coil. Now the module takes care of it, and we see the result of the module's current control action in this step. Now, we come over here, we can see the KV line, and the KV line, of course, is the result of the circuit opening up and the field collapsing in the coil, and we see the spark drops, coil oscillations, and it begins again. Now, for analysis, let's go back to one millisecond per division and look at this burn line. Okay, the normal burn line, as we said earlier, is gonna be from one to two milliseconds. We're set at one millisecond per division, and if we measure from the KV line, which is lined up to this first vertical graticule line, that's the dark line on the display, we see that the majority of these firings are going one, little over one division. So we've got a burn time of about 1.2 milliseconds, and that's good. Now, this other one that we see, we see that it's shorter in time, and it's not even, not quite one division. So that's a little bit less than one millisecond. I'm going to use the vertical position to line up the off time of the circuit to the horizontal center, horizontal graticule line. We notice that the burn voltage is almost going up one complete division, and the bad one's going higher. The voltage is higher to jump across the spark plug. So what do we have here? We have a case of some bad. The brightness of the display also gives us an indication of how often it's bad. You notice the more it happens, the more it repeats itself, the brighter the display is. And that's one of the advantages of the analog scope over LCD type scopes. LCD type scopes don't give you an indication of repetitiveness where the analog scope does. And that's going to be very important when we parade out the ignition. And that's just exactly what we need to do here. Parade out the ignition, so let's go to it. We've identified a some bad problem. Now we want to parade out the ignition so we can pinpoint the cylinder, the plug, or the plug wire that is causing the problem. The next step is to grab the external trigger pickup. That's the one that looks like the RPM pickup off the timing light. 
we want to insert the BNC connector into the external trigger jack located in the top right hand corner of the scope and safely route the cable across the engine away from anything hot or any pulleys and connect it around the number one plug wire. Try to position it so it's away from the other plug wires and make sure that the clamping, the jaw, is making a good uh, connection to itself around the plug wire. Once we've done that, come back to your scope, to the trigger section up in the top right hand corner, and set the source, the trigger source, to external. Now the scope will trigger off of the external trigger pickup which is connected to number one. The trigger mode, we are going to go to normal. We had it set on auto. Auto was an automatic update of the display. Normal is telling the scope, do not make a display until the requirements of the trigger are met, which means this, the source is set to external. That source signal from the number one plug wire has to reach the level set by the trigger level adjustment. And we will do that after we start the car. There's no reason to mess with that until the car is started. We're all set. Let's start the car back up. Now that we've got the external trigger hooked up and the trigger source set the external, if you don't have a display, that could be because you have your trigger mode set to normal and the trigger level is not adjusted at a level of the signal that's coming into the ex from the external trigger source. So if you're not set to normal on the trigger mode, do that now. And here's auto, which allows it to update automatically come down once to normal. Now our goal is to get the display to start flashing at about the same rate as, a time, as you would expect a timing light at idle. And uh, we're going to do that by taking the trigger level and maximizing it all the way to the left or to the right. And then slowly start to bring it back until we get a display flashing at about the same rate as a timing light. There we go. You see it right there? just like you would expect a timing light to flash. Now the next step is to start parading them out. Once it's flashing like a timing light, we're looking at just cylinder number one. So we're going to take the time per division knob and start slowing it down until we get three cylinders on the screen. This would be number one, three, four, and number two is not quite in there, but it could be hidden behind the screen here. So we're going to take our position knob and scroll the waveform to our left and we see the dwell time starting to come in. Well, instead of using the time per division to bring it in, we're going to use our sweep variable knob, which is the red one next to the time per division. Because at this point, when we're parading them out trying to identify the cylinder, we're not worried about measuring a burn time or anything like that. So it's okay to take it out of sweep, out of sweep um, calibration. So let's take the sweep variable knob, pull it out of its detent, and watch very carefully here on the screen until the next plug signal starts to show up. There's the dwell coming in. There's the burn right there. Now let's scroll back to the left. Here's number one, number three, number four, and there's number two. They're all paraded out. Now, it's kind of hard to tell which one's bad at this point, and if you look very closely, you could see the burn lines, and you could see one that's higher than the other, and you can identify the bad cylinder. Let's take a close-up view of that and see what we got. Now that we got a close-up view, it's pretty easy to tell which one's the problem. We have number cylinder number one. We have cylinder number one, number three, number four, number two. Notice how number notice okay notice how number 3 is up just a little bit higher than the others. And let's scroll over number 2, the last one on the display and make sure it's down low. Sure enough, we only have one bad cylinder here. Now, whether you're looking at 4 cylinder, 8 cylinder, whether you have a fast idle or not, there's another thing we can do. We can inspect individually, in detail, each one of these plug firings. Over here on the position knob, 
we have a 10x magnification. If you read the little label there, it says 10x mag. This will take the waveform that's on the display, magnify it by 10, the sweep speed. So right now, we're set at 10 milliseconds. By pulling this out, we will increase the sweep speed to one millisecond. Notice now we don't even see the waveform. Well, this is how we deal with it. Use your horizontal position knob to scroll all the way to the right until the number one plug fire is lined up with the center vertical graticule line right here. Right now, we're just looking at cylinder number one. And if we look at it, we can see that it's working fairly good. We're coming up about one division, and we're, the burn line is just over one division in time. And so that means we've got one millisecond per division, a little over one division. We are maybe 1.2 milliseconds, as we saw before. Now I'm going to slowly scroll back. That was number one. That's number three. I scrolled it to the left. Now right here we can see the dwell begin and the dwell current control. The KV line would be here and we see the spark. Looking closely at this, oh, the waveform changed. Do you know why the waveform moved on me? Because the engine changed speed. The cooling fan came on. So the idle stabilizer worked, sped up the engine for a second. Notice how it came back into view. The engine stabilized. No problem. Use your position knob to bring it back into view. Now this is cylinder number three, like we said, and this was the bad one. Notice how the KV line's a little bit higher. Well, you can't see the KV line. Notice how the spark line is a little bit higher. And let's scroll on over to the next one. There's number four. We've come back down on the spark line, and the burn time for the spark is good. Now we're on to number two. Notice it's jumping in and out of there because of the RPM changes. But if you look closely, it's there. And I'm going to slow down my sweep variable knob just a little bit so I can make sure it stays in the display. There we go. That's number two, and it's good. So here's what we did. We had it set up to 10 milliseconds per division. And we saw all four waveforms in the display. We used our sweep variable to make sure that the last waveform, number two, was showing up. We used the variable position to make sure it wasn't hiding around the corner. We noticed the burn lines. The burn line for the second plug firing was a little bit high, and that's cylinder number three. Notice how low the other ones are. Number three is a little bit high. To confirm that and to see them in detail, we pulled out the 10x magnification. We used the horizontal position to line up the number one plug to the center of the screen, the vertical graticule line, which is the line that runs up and down. Okay, there's number one. We scroll to the left. Number three which was the bad one, which is obviously bad. Number four, which is good. Number two. This takes a little practice, and it's just a matter of doing it. Do it. Do it. Let's do a quick review. On this car, we were dealing with HEI. We took our secondary pickup and went to the cap. We used an HEI adapter. On standard ignition systems with a coil wire, we would have gone to the coil wire, not the plug wires, and that's a common mistake. If we were dealing with DIS that doesn't have a coil wire and it has individual coils for every two spark plugs, we are going to go to the individual spark plugs because if you think about it, those spark plug wires are almost like a coil wire, aren't they? That will give you a strong signal. When you're dealing with DIS, you do not need to use the external trigger pickup because you're going to synchronize the display off of the signal coming into your channel. There's no parading out of these signals. You're going to look at one at a time, and you will invert the waveform as needed. Very simple. If you just think about the whole dynamics of the ignition systems, it will fall into place. Now, going back to the strategy, our strategy was Parade only happens if you have a some bad situation. So we started out with superimpose, 
we check the general condition of the ignition system. If we had an all good situation, we stopped right there. If we had an all bad, we went and followed that path because we didn't need to identify. In a some bad situation, we go to individual plug wires and we're going to do that by parading out the ignition and one after the other on the display. And that's, we're going to do that with the external trigger pickup. And it's as simple as that. The way to master this is to just do it. If you don't spend the time practicing this, if you spent one hour a week for one week practicing this setup, it will become like second nature to you. And that's the bottom line. The lab scopes are setting the standard of the way things are going to be. And it's just a matter of doing it.